Hi there team and welcome to an update on our situation in Iceland. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Today is Monday, February 12th. It's about 2.30 p.m. here Mountain Standard Time, 9.30 p.m. in Iceland. And just want to welcome you all. Thank you for your support, encouragement, uh, all you've done to help build this channel and community of people interested in geology and learning. So we'll get right to it. And the plan for today is to go over the eruption that happened briefly on Thursday, just kind of quick overview there, look at the latest data, some things that have been happening in Iceland. As a quick programming note, um, I will be doing a, another Iceland update as a live stream broadcast on Thursday, that's this Thursday the 15th of February, that'll be at 9 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, which would be 4 p.m. UTC. Um, there'll be some other videos probably sprinkled in throughout the week, more of my typical field type geology videos. And then I will be gone this weekend uh, to Bryce Canyon National Park to do some cross country skiing. But I'll try to do some videos from that region. I'll make sure there's a few videos that launch over that weekend as well. As always, I want to thank Amanda Joe for providing some of the content here. She sends me these very organized emails with lots of different news stories, lots of things related to what's going on in Iceland, and definitely makes my job easier to be able to, be able to um, go through those, kind of pick and choose the things I want to share, and then bring that to you. So thanks as always to her. And if you're interested in making a donation to her and some of her situations as a displaced a uh, good Indivik resident. There's a PayPal link for her under the video description. So let's get right to it. Uh, we had our eruption on Thursday of last week, February 8th, and it was incredibly short lived. It was more or less a 24 hour or a little bit over that, I suppose, uh, officially, but it was a very short eruption that occurred. Um, it largely was in this area here, so we can see the eruptive vent here shown in red. Uh, kind of an interesting little elbow geometry here where the, the fissure at the southern end followed more of a, a north-south direction. Uh, and then we can see the associated lava field here, largely of no impact to people in Iceland except for this, this channel, this tongue of lava that came down across the roadway and the entrance that takes you to the Blue Lagoon and the power plant. Um, it didn't follow the road all the way up against the berm, shown in yellow here. It actually followed this low channel, this little low pathway. <clears throat> but what it did do was flow over the pipeline. So this is the pipeline that leads from the power plant area and supplies the hot water and the heat to be distributed out throughout the rest of the peninsula. Um, so in some ways it was a it was easier in some ways, I suppose. Easier is not the right word. It was a lower impact eruption on the surface, but you can easily make the argument, and I, and I think I will, that this was a bigger, a more impactful eruption because of the pipeline that was compromised here. So uh, re whereas you know previous eruptions were affecting Gudindavik, which was evacuated, now we have this eruption that disrupted the pipeline's ability to transmit hot water and heat and that's affecting a much bigger population tens of thousands of people um, so that's a much bigger deal uh, also as we watch this eruption take place uh, we did see uh, with my live stream broadcast and in other views as well that part of it became phreatomagmatic so during my live stream on that day you can see in this top right corner view here uh, that's kind of crazy. There's like two of me on the screen. Um, oh, well. Um, but you can see this plume here where we have the white steam coming out and then these vigorous plumes of black ash. And this is where the eruption took a little bit different turn from what we've seen previously. And some of that lava was interacting with groundwater and that water was being flashed into steam. It was it was exploding or ripping up the lava, if you will, into tiny little shards of dark ash. Most of that drifted off to the south and wasn't impactful in any way, but a little different behavior than what we'd seen before in having a groundwater supply mixing with some of that lava during the waning phases of that eruption on the afternoon of February 8th. So that was a little bit different uh, type of behavior than what we've seen uh, in the past. Uh, that's good for that one. Um, okay, so let's get to the latest then. That was just a quick overview of what was going on 
last week, if you weren't uh, watching or paying attention there, we do have the latest Met Office update um, here, and they have put out a new hazard map, which I'll get to in a second. Um, basically, in looking at some of their data, though, the inflation has started again. We'll look at the GPS data here in a second as well. Um, so more or less within the few first few hours of this eruption ending, we started seeing signs of magma inflation right back into the system. So that eruption on February 8th relieved some of the excess pressurized magma that had accumulated in the subsurface. That eruption released some of that, but now we're seeing everything returning back to uh, the baseline of the magma system being inflated, continued influx of magma into the system. So they're seeing inflation rates here of about a half to one centimeter per day, similar to what we saw prior to the eruption. It is therefore highly likely that the cycle continues in a few weeks with another dike propagation and a volcanic eruption. So we're expecting to see, and I'll get to the GPS data here in a bit as well. Um, so the hazard map from the Met Office is, make that a little bit smaller, has been updated as well. So they're still, they've got the, uh, all the lava flows plotted on here now in gray. So you can see the December one over here. Uh, the February 8th one last week actually overlaps a good chunk of the December flows, but then the February one uh, deviates a bit by flowing along the south to the west edge of uh, Stora Stogafell, this hill here, little tongue that went off to the north, and then this problematic and longer tongue of lava that went over the road, and then also the pipeline. Um, the Blue Lagoon was evacuated, um, and there's no damage or impact so far to the Blue Lagoon or the power plant, um, but we really didn't have that berm tested because this lava ended up going down a, a, short, a small pre-existing channel there. And then we have the January 14th and 15th uh, flows down here at the south end. So the red zone is still considered the most likely place for the next eruption um, based on what we've been seeing in terms of GPS data and earthquake activity. So very similar map to what we've seen in the past. Let's look at the earthquake data over the last 24 hours. And as we've seen in the past, we're starting to fall into this um, pattern of you know the the lull between eruptions and what that looks like in terms of earthquake activity, GPS, uh, ground deformation, and then what it looks like right before the eruption, during the eruption as as well. So we're starting to see it settling into uh, these sort of crude patterns of behavior. And so you can see here uh, the only earthquakes of consequence have been not so much along uh, the dike or the magma intrusion that we saw here last week on February 8th, but a little bit to the east over near the Fagardalsfjot um, volcanic system. Again, small earthquakes, fairly deep down where we think this magma body lies. Of course, the magma body is actually over here, but these earthquakes over here are most likely related to stress generation. So I'm, I'm not ready to jump on the bandwagon of looking at any any cluster of earthquakes, whether it's three earthquakes or even 30 earthquakes in this region, and assuming that it is related to uh, magma moving in the crust. There's a little cluster here also near uh, in, I suppose, uh, Lake Klevervatn. Uh, and so you can see these ones here. Again, pretty deep, five kilometers, small magnitudes. Um, nothing really to get, I think, too alarmed about. So there's the earthquake activity there. Um, not much really to report. Some of the other clusters we've seen over the last few weeks seem to have died down. The big offshore earthquakes are pretty much gone. There was a, a 3.7 out here, but kind of isolated and a little bit deeper. So nothing really alarming when we look at the, the seismic data. When we get to the GPS data, uh, there's some interesting trends, some predictable trends. Let's go to uh, the Svartsengi station, which is the one we've been focusing on probably the most. And so you can see the uh, uplift of the station over time, the December 18th eruption, uh, dropping that station back down uh, a few tens of millimeters, subsequent uplift of the area as magma was being inflated. The January 14th event doesn't have the big 
down drop that we see with some of the other ones. But then over here at February 8th, the eruption that occurred last week, we do see that down drop uh, in the elevation at this station. And then what we've seen since then is you can see that upward trend of the data there, um, presumed to reflect the inflation of the magma there. Um, so we can see that nice trend on that plot. We've seen that elsewhere. If we look at the uh, station to the west, the Elbert station, you can see the December 18th, January 14th, and February 8th. So it's starting to look a little bit more regular. Uh, each station goes a little bit higher than the previous one before the eruption is triggered. And then the subsequent deflation uh, is a little bit higher elevation at each point than the one that preceded it. So some interesting trends there. And I haven't had the time to, to dig in to all the data the way I'd like to. Uh, but that's some of the interesting trends that have taken place over the last couple of days. So in short, what we're seeing with the GPS data is magma inflation, the elevation rising, the whole system recharging. And if we project that behavior out for the next few weeks, that would mean that we should have subsequently then a eruption. You can take any one of these uh, you know, graphs here like this one um, and extrapolate that that set of data points and that slope or that trend up to get to some critical threshold there. My lights went out again. Um, and then sort of make some inferences there. So we're probably, you know, if this, this relies on a lot of assumptions and a lot of variables, but if we assume constant magma influx and everything that we've been assuming in the past, probably looking at another eruption, maybe first week in March, perhaps, um, early March. So maybe two and a half weeks, three weeks, something on that order. So we'll, only time will tell, uh, but we'll have to see moving forward. And going right along with that, here's one of the leading Icelandic scientists who's been monitoring all these events, uh, Professor Thordarsson, who uh, I wanted to just bring out a couple things he says in this article here. He he talks about the, the uplift and um, it's, it's likely to make headlines again in about three weeks, which we just talked about, that projection of the uplift data. Um, but here's something interesting he said that, again, I just, I just wish I was the reporter. I wish I could ask the follow-up questions here because he sometimes um, makes statements, and I'm not by any means disputing what he's saying. I just wish he would elaborate a little bit and provide some rationale to support some of these statements he's making. So here he's saying, uh, it's just that we're going to see further movement to the west. If that happens, the chances increase that it will move to Elver. So that's the next crater system off to the west of the power plant. And the areas west of the Gurindavik where the fish farm is, there may be some movement in that area. People, therefore, should keep an eye on it. And maybe it's not wise to have people in that area. So I just don't understand, and maybe someone can help me out, why he thinks we're going to see further movement to the west. If we go back to... Our, our Google Earth map, what he's saying, we're, we're a place that, and he's not the only one. There was another Icelandic scientist that at the beginning of all this back in November um, thought that we might see some of the activity uh, over here in this system. And I don't doubt that we could get an eruption there. I just don't see anything in the current data that suggests that we're going to get an eruption over there. So remember, we had uh, the the November 10th intrusion, which was something like that. Of course, that didn't result in an eruption, but it produced a lot of earthquakes. I shared that awesome paper with you last time in the Journal of Science, where they talk about how quickly that magma intruded through the rocks and created that dike, that intrusion sh shown there in orange. Uh, they actually were able to calculate the rate of influx or the, um, the flow rate, if you will, through the subsurface. So you can see where that occurred on November 10th. And then that, of course, was followed up about a month later with the December 18th eruption here. Uh, and then that, of course, was followed up with the January 14th eruption down here shown in pink. Uh, and then, of course, last week on Thursday, we had the February 8th eruption shown here in red. And some of that's underneath the, the orange there. Uh, and I want to thank real quick one of my viewers, David uh, Gunzler who actually sent me these 
Google Earth files, these shape files, he digitized the lava flows uh, and sent those to me, and I really appreciate that, and that that's great because that gives me the um, the lava flows extent, their aerial extent, these lava fields on Google Earth, which is very valuable. But my point is, is that I just don't understand where his interpretation or conclusion is being arrived at that we would get a um, eruption over here. And I don't know if this is the the fi these must be the fish farms he's talking about over here. So he is suggesting, and he stated it before, and I think another Icelandic scientist did as well, that that they, there's going to be an eruption here at some point. They keep they keep reiterating that, and again, that's I'm fine with that. There's nothing that says we can't have an eruption there, but for me, until I see some of the data showing that an eruption here is likely or forthcoming, I just don't know why that's worth mentioning. For now, all the activity is here. Uh, the magma body sits somewhere in this area. It has established well, uh, is it well established these pathways to the east that have fed these eruptive vents we see over here with these last three eruptions. And so, why the magma? So until I see something different in terms of data, um, I think the safest assumption would be our, our next eruption is likely to take place. You know, in this region between the pink lava field down here from January and these these other eruptions here up to the north. So interesting. I uh, just wish there was some context and and rationale provided there. But um, but a great uh, scientist. I've read some of his books and papers. I'm not discounting anything he says. Uh, it's just always nice to get some evidence or data to back up any sort of interpretation you make. Um, so the other bit of news then as we move on a bit from the science is now we'll talk a little bit more about the human component. So we mentioned before that the eruption flowed over this section of the pipeline. So the plan A uh, the entire time was to have the pipeline supplying hot water and heat to much of the peninsula including the airport region uh, with this pipeline here. And that was compromised last week with this eruption. So plan B, as I understand it, was they were going to bypass this section. Um, and then that didn't work out. So they were on to plan C. And so I first want to give a tremendous amount of just credit. It was really a Herculean effort of just getting it done, grittiness. Uh, I shared last time that the conditions in repairing the pipeline and dealing with this problem were pretty awful. It was bitter cold. Um, you know, they had to deal with the water freezing. There was just a lot going on uh, for the workers here. The welders, um, other types of workers have been working to get this pipeline fixed. And at the time, I think they were looking at it being several days, but they were actually able to get this thing done in a tremendously short amount of time. And what they were able to do, so let me show you this here, um, is they were able to build a road. So over that lava flow that's still cooling and is not completely solidified at depth. So there's a camera here live from Iceland, and it's going to zoom in on that section of the road over there. And they've already built, this was from, yeah, this was from yesterday, I believe. So you can see They've already built a crude roadway, brought in some fill material, uh, put it right over the top of that black lava flow, and built a crude roadway up and over this lava tongue. And then the idea then is then they put down the pipeline just right over the top of the flow uh, to reestablish the hot water and the heating there. Uh, so really just a phenomenal effort and uh, crazy that they could do it in such short time. So. You know, you, you, you reach one roadblock and you just go to another. You can see places along that brown roadway, these little white plumes of uh, steam and gas coming out of them. I've got another view of that I'll share with you here. So here's a video clip, and I'll make sure these are all in the description. But now we're down on that roadway. Here's the lava flow off to the side in black, and you can see... You can see the places where... Uh, there's still volcanic gases and steam coming out from the lava flow and just escaping through parts of the roadway there. So pretty incredible. 
um, that they were able to do that. There's some of the welders working on um, welding different sections of the pipeline together, getting them put together. Looks like a nice day, but it was pretty cold and windy there, I guess. Even though the, the sun's been out and it hasn't been stormy, uh, the temperatures have been quite cold. So pretty awesome there. Um, and so if I had to summarize what's taken place with the, let me find this real quick. What's taken place with the, whoops, um, with the water system over the past few days, um, I would say more or less that they, let's see where we at, that they, um, you know, the pipeline's now in place um, over the top of that lava flow, that they have been able to deliver water to parts of the peninsula, but not all as of this time. There's some leaks in it that they're fixing and they're not able to properly pressurize the system as of yet because of those leaks. Um, and so only some of the houses are getting hot water right now and, and heat. So it's not getting to everyone just yet. But the fact that they are able to fix it as quickly as they did is just is just pretty incredible. Uh, and then there's a few articles here, um, yeah, about the leaks. You know, they had to, they have to as soon as they weld it, they have to test the water flowing through it and see if the the welds hold, I suppose, and then patch those up. But that's all in the works. Uh, and then here's sort of the official statement from the company that supplies the, the hot water and heat to these folks. So there's a few communities that still haven't got water. Um, and this is as of um, 5.50 p.m. in Iceland this evening. Uh, they're building pressure. They're still asking people to conserve water when they can, um, but pretty incredible. So, um, and remember too, as we kind of look back at the the roadway there and part of that clip we saw that rock is a really good insulator. So even though this lava here is something like you know, 700 degrees Celsius, which would be 1300 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere in there, um, you know, it'll still continue to cool, albeit slowly, um, but there's really no danger in terms of heat from the lava flow uh, working its way up and, and making this an unsafe roadway. You can see the people standing there uh, the trucks driving over it, putting the pipe back down on top of it shouldn't be a problem because rock is a really good insulator. So even though we, we may still have um, very hot material below the surface in that lava flow that's cooling, uh, it's probably not that thick, first of all, maybe, I don't know, four or five meters at the most. And um, this road material that they put down here is sort of helping to insulate uh, it itself from the underlying lava there which is pretty pretty awesome so uh, yeah you got to hand it to the Icelanders they're they're really good about just you know they're, they're, there's a problem they just get things done so I think the bigger issue moving forward and we'll kind of conclude with this here team um, I think there's some serious I don't want to say problems but issues that we have moving forward in this area we, we are now looking at another eruption in the next few weeks and and the the idea would be this could continue on for the foreseeable future. No one knows when volcanic activity in this region might be put on, uh, you know, take a break or have a hiatus or change or shift locations. So for the foreseeable future, we're going to have more eruptions in this area. You can see how close some of these vents have been, these thick lines to the power plant region. So even though we've established these pathways over here, and this is where we expect there to be future eruptions, and even though we've built these protective berms around the power plant in the Blue Lagoon and partially around uh, Gudindavik as well, this, there's nothing, it's not foolproof, right? The, the next eruption could be inside the berm. Um, and if we lose the power plant, we lose the Blue Lagoon. Uh, and if we lose the power plant, we also would that would be huge. So not only does a power plant supply hot water and heat, but obviously it supplies also the electricity. There's one other power plant on the whole Reykjanes Peninsula that I'm aware of uh, that's down here. But this power plant, the way I understand it, only supplies power to the grid, not hot water and heating. So if you lost this power plant, that would be bad from an electrical standpoint because then you would uh, have one less contributor to the grid but that would eliminate the ability to get hot water and heat to so many of these homes we're in the north atlantic it's a very cold climate and so i think 
you know, I think the best thing to do, and I'm sure this is already happening, would be to take a good hard look moving forward um, at other options. Like what, what if we lose this power plant? What would we do? Are there other less, um, are there other places to develop that geothermal energy that have less of a risk? I've had people ask me like, why did they build the power plant on top of the magma chamber? Well, at the time they built the power plant, it was just a known geothermal resource. There was no evidence that suggested at that time that there was an active body of magma there, and there probably wasn't. We only started seeing um, data that suggested that magma was starting to intrude this area in, I think, late 2019 and into 2020. And of course, those eruptions were over here, and uh, now the eruptions have shifted back to the west. Um, but this entire peninsula is a part of a plate boundary it's part of a volcanic and tectonic system um, it's a bit of a crapshoot to predict when and where you might get the next magma intrusion whether it's this one now or one in the next few years to tens of years um, and so they, they need to take probably a good hard look at where can we get our how can we shore up our power supply and have backup options where would that come from uh, and I don't have great answers for them on those fronts um, but something to think about. Maybe, maybe there's some thoughts about like these pipelines that run along the ground. We we just saw that those are problematic. Is there a way to elevate those pipelines? Uh, they do have a, and I think it's along this road here. Um, there's actually a power line that runs along here too. But they had gone in and built up like a little protective wall of rock around a pedestal, if you will, around those power lines. And those seems to have uh, held up pretty well. So, you know, there's ways it can be done. There's ways to protect the infrastructure um, from being compromised in these events. It's just a matter of, you know, putting the energy and the money and the resources into that. Um, so, yeah, something to think about. And then I'll conclude with this little bit here. Um, I've seen in various media reports and even I've got emails from viewers about uh, the whole peninsula, quote unquote, waking up uh, that we've had these three eruptions here. Now we've had three eruptions here. We've had little clusters of earthquakes in other areas. And there's the idea or the thought out there that the, the whole peninsula is waking up in terms of volcanic activity and we might be seeing eruptions take place all over this region and, and that may be true I'm not saying it's not but I think the better more measured approach is just to um, prepare ahead like let's get you know we realize a good end now well it's abandoned and, and evacuated but there there is a known hazard there there's things we can do like these protective walls to protect what's there uh, we might start building protective walls around some of these communities to the north if we have one of these fissures open up a little bit further to the north, that lava is going to head north rather than south. And so maybe putting in some of those protective barriers here. There's been plenty of news stories about some of the outskirts of the capital area um, and putting in some protective barriers around those regions. Should one of these other volcanic systems uh, have an eruption, I think that's a wise move. So I think, I think, you know, there's some big challenges in place. And I know that they'll rise to the occasion and come up with some good solutions but it's a question of time and money and resources as to how how you address this moving forward people are already in these communities you're not likely to move the entire capital region to some other part of Iceland so what can we do to mitigate or lessen the effects of some of these potential volcanic episodes that might take place in the future so uh, just a thought there to share with you um, if I get some time and read another uh, paper to share with you, I'll try to do that before the next update. But barring any unforeseen big events, I'll do my next update as a live stream. So that'll be on Thursday again, Thursday the 15th of February, 9 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, which would be 4 p.m. in Iceland or UTC. Hope you can join me. If you can't, of course, you can catch the replay then. Uh, if you have questions, we'll do uh, some viewer Q&A. Susan and Amanda Joe, I know, will be on there as moderators. So we'll have some folks there that can help organize the questions. And Amanda Joe can answer any questions you might have about some of the residents there and more of like the 
the inside scoop. But I'll do my best to handle your questions related to geology, um, not just in Iceland, but if I guess if you have some other more broad questions, I'll try to answer those as best I can as well. So we'll see you uh, then. I hope you can make it. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for your support, for providing uh, me this opportunity to share with so many of you and for being such great community of people who are interested in the earth, learning, um, and just being fascinated by earth processes. So thank you again and have a good day.